final lecture, final week of the class Neuronal Dynamics. We have developed a whole framework for mathematical modeling of neurons. Now let's turn to in vivo data. Can this framework be used there? We said at the beginning that for a good model we would expect that we want to predict spike times, subthreshold voltage, we want to have a model that's interpretable, we want a model that has a systematic parameter optimization procedure, and we have all this for in vitro data. Now for in vivo data, in most cases recordings are done extracellularly, which means that you don't have access to subthreshold voltage. But it's still a useful model. We can use the same framework, the framework of generalized linear models, for example to characterize receptive fields. Suppose you're recording, you record from a neuron in visual cortex while a stimulus is presented and the stimulus may appear at different locations randomly all over the field. And whenever it falls inside the sensitive zone, the receptive field of the neuron, the neuron is more likely to emit a spike. A model of encoding means that we want to understand the transform from the stimulus to the spikes that the experimental observes with the electrode. Now for receptive fields, we have a spatial receptive field, so that this is the screen and the light dot may occur wherever, for example in the field number 19. So the input vector is now a spatial vector and uh, a single stimulus at time 1 might be that the light sits here, in time 2 it might be the light is here, in time k it might be that the light is down here, and somewhere in between it's here. It's randomly moving around. So, one instantiation of the stimulus is a vector x with many zeros and a single one. That's where the light point sits. This input is multiplied with a spatial filter. Now this k here, k sub k, is something like a spatial pattern that would represent the response properties of the neurons. And that's the spatial receptive field. In a similar fashion to the discussion we had before, we can also extend this and have both spatial and temporal components. Now this gives the voltage of this neuron. This spatial and temporal filter K describes the whole processing from the eye over several intermediate steps until the neuron in visual cortex from which our friend experimentalist is recording. And then we take this membrane voltage, the model voltage, and say, well, there's a certain firing intensity. The higher the voltage, the more likely is the neuron to fire. And this is called the linear, nonlinear Poisson model. So we have our stimulus, we have a linear filter, that would be our vector k, the filter k sub in the index k, then we have some nonlinearity, that's our function f, we use this to generate spikes with an inhomogeneous Poisson process, and this gives the linear nonlinear Poisson model. Now this is a special case of the model we had before. The model before had in addition this post-spike current, the spike after current. The linear filter can be combined with a temporal filter, here modeled as a leaky integrator. So we are back here in the framework of generalized linear models or spike response models with escape noise. Let's see how well such a model does for the prediction of retinal ganglion cell activity. 
there's a large field stimulation of the, of the retina, light is switched on and off, and this retinal ganglion cell, one cell, is responding like this to several repetitions of the stimulus. If you just take a LNP model, you find this kind of responses after optimization of parameters. And you see, you see that if you zoom in on one of these bursts, that the real neuron has some regularity. Now, trials are ordered so that you are able to see this regularity. They wouldn't occur naturally in this order. They are ordered after the recordings. But you see that there's, after the first spike, there's always a pause related to refractoriness. And this pause is missing in the LNP model, but it is present in the GLM model. Why? Because the GLM model has the capacity to account for spike after effects. If you sum over all the different trials, you get the PSDH, you get the rate defined in the PSDH for solid line, the real retinal ganglion cell, and the GLM is the gray line. And you see an excellent match, whereas the LNP is slightly off from time to time. So it's important to have these spike after effects as part of the model. Now, a retinal ganglion cell, the one of these models, will talk to other retinal ganglion cells nearby. So an even better model would be a network of GLMs, coupled GLMs. And if you study again a single cell, but now part of a network, and you've also recorded the other cells, you have optimized the parameters of the other cells, then this fully coupled network is even better in the PSDH, PSDH prediction and the spike prediction than the uncoupled model. Now this is an example of encoding. We present a stimulus and we record in the LGN somewhere in between or in the visual cortex we determine the receptive fields. We can predict spike times given knowledge of the stimulus. Our model is easy to interpret and it's flexible and we have a systematic procedure to, to optimize parameters. This is the scenario of encoding. Now we can turn the flow of the arguments around. Suppose after model optimization, suppose now that we just see the spikes here, would we be able to predict the stimulus given the observed spike times? Now this looks like an academic problem. However, it's not. There are human patients who have lost, say, an arm. Would it be possible to record from motor cortex or from frontal cortex where plans for movements are made and just by observing the spike times predict the arm movement that the human intends to do next. If so, one could use this knowledge to drive motors of an arm prosthesis so that the arm moves in the intended direction. This likes, sounds like an exciting venue and indeed many groups worldwide work on this problem. Now interestingly, it's the same kind of generalized linear model that's used in many cases in this endeavor. So the model of decoding has the same flavor as our model of encoding, but it becomes useful for something that looks important for human beings. And here is an example now in an in M1 cortex of a monkey, while the monkey performs 
some hand movement, you can record the vertical velocity of the hand and the horizontal velocity of the hand while measuring spikes in the brain. Later you just look at the spikes and you try, try for a new movement to predict the intended arm movement. And you see that the actual movement and the intended movement are very, very similar. So this is the final slide. In this class, we have spent a lot of time to develop the mathematics around neuron modeling. We talked about computational neuron science for single neurons. And some of you may have asked the question, why all this math? Is it worthwhile? And I would say, yes. It's worthwhile because once you have understood these mathematical models, it's these kind of models that can be used for decoding of new old spike trains and eventually help human patients.